what we're going to be working in is chapter seven. We are going to have um, an exam when we finish chapter seven. Um, and in 7.1, we're just going to kind of ease into it. We're going to start working with angles. And so um, you're going to see this a lot and you guys are kind of STEM kids and you're going to be going through more math classes. You'll notice that sometimes when you start with your class, you start with kind of basics. You start with, okay, I know that, but it gives us a stepping point to kind of stair step from there. Um, and so kind of part one, we're going to start with vocabulary and kind of see, make sure we understand all the ins and outs of it. And trick is kind of unique. Um, not unique, but it's kind of interesting because you're going to see me say things that you learned in geometry. You're going to see things that you picked up from the end of pre-cal, and it's going to kind of put everything together of why you even needed to learn that in those previous classes. Okay, so first let's start with some vocabulary. If you remember array, um, this thing consists of one point. It's a one point, a line, and all points extending in one direction. And so if we kind of draw this, you're going to see a point here. I'm going to call this, say, F, and I mean E, and then there's F. Um, they either say that this is ray EF, or you'll see it written as EF and then a ray on top of it. Um, they would call it EF and not FE because the first letter is the one where the ray is starting. Now, you start with ray and this random definition um, because of our next definition. We want to look at an angle. An angle. is the union of two rays. And so we need our definition of ray in order to get um, our definition of angle. Angle is the union of two rays, having an endpoint, the endpoint is the vertex of the angle. in the two rays. Are... That was me, sorry. And the two rays are the sides of the angles. So um, if I take that ray EF, here's E, here's F, um, and say I put another ray with it. Here's ray ED, then I would take ray ED and EF, and those form, they do kind of a Less than sign there, um, angle D E F. And so you can see we label the angle based off um, the vertex being in the middle there. So I would say D E F, or I could say F E D, but E would have to be in the middle of that. Now, as we kind of get moving in this chapter, um, we've kind of got to establish um, a vocabulary foundation, or we possibly, if you want to say, we need to kind of identify what we're going to be working with here. So just to kind of get us going, let's review some Greek letters. Have you ever worked with some Greek letters? Let's go ahead and write them and name them. So if I say them later, you know which I'm talking about. So we've got theta. We've got phi, or sometimes it's written kind of like a zero with a line through it. We got alpha. Beta. OK. 
camera. Um, and all of these we kind of will be using to represent angles. Now let me give you a word to the wise. Um, if we are using theta in a problem, stay with theta. You don't want to say, and this is the rookie mistake that I made when I was going through college, I'd be like, oh my goodness, I cannot write that gamma. Like you can see my gamma is kind of messed up there. Oh my, I'm not good at writing gamma. I'm just going to write something else. And then it ate my lunch because I was working along proof in one of my graduate classes. I picked a different Greek letter and lo and behold, that teacher started using that Greek letter I've fixed. And so then for like the rest of the pages, it was like two or three pages, I was mentally having to switch out my letters because she was using the one that I had picked and she needed both of them and it was a hot mess, okay? So just as we're using letters and we're using some of these Greek letters, just make sure that you kind of stick with what we're doing. Don't just kind of choose a different one because you don't, you don't like writing that one. Now, all this being said, as we're kind of writing an angle, Let's kind of draw another angle and we're going to do lots of drawing in here and I'm going to try and draw as best as I can um, kind of draw things out here. So let's just kind of label here's going to be your vertex. Um, if my angle starts here and you'll see it, it goes as an arrow up where it starts. That ray is your initial side and then where it ends is your terminal side. Okay, and we're going to kind of use these definitions of terminal and initial as we um, clarify and define some other steps. So I just wanted to emphasize that we've got our initial side, we've got our terminal side. Now, measure of an angle. So we're kind of defining things here. Measure of an angle. This is The amount, uh-oh, we're going to get our lives together this week. My thing is starting to run out of battery, and it died. I'm still here. It just died and froze on me here. You guys couldn't find your heads up. I have a, a dying thing here. Where'd it go? in order here. All right, sorry about that. Okay, so we're looking at a measure of the angle and this is the amount of rotation from the initial side, like we just labeled, to the terminal side. amount of rotation from the initial side to the terminal side. 
Now, all this being said, most times we're going to be drawing our angles um, kind of on a coordinate plane. So when we're looking at something like that, um, say I drew this angle here. It kind of went this way here. You can see it kind of has a one-way arrow. It doesn't kind of do arrow both ways. That is because this is what we're going to be calling the initial side. Here is our terminal side. This is based off this being my x axis, this being my y axis. What's really neat about trig, and I don't know how much your teacher talked about it at the end of pre -cal, but we use the unit circle a lot. Now, as you move into calculus, because I feel like that's what y'all are going to do next, um, you use the mess out of that unit circle already. I'm quizzing the class. I have Cal 2 this semester, and I'm quizzing them. Do you remember your unit circle? Do you know this? And trig kind of defines and um, shows you why we do what we do and why we get the tricks that we trick and how we got to be in there. So it's kind of neat because you're going to get the details from this. Um, if this angle is moving, kind of counterclockwise with this, this is going to be the positive angle. But if I had another axis and say this angle dropped down this way, you can see the arrow is going this way. I'm not going this side. I'm going, dropping down like this. This would be a negative angle. And again, all the things are still the same. This is your x-axis. This is your y-axis. This would be your initial side here. And this would be your terminal side. So this arrow kind of tells you which way we're moving to get that angle. Um, and again, everything from your coordinate plane still applies. Like this is still quadrant one, two, three, and four. And always remember it because it's a coordinate plane. It makes a C. And that's how you kind of identify those. So kind of just right here at the beginning, we've kind of got to get our basis, our foundation, and our definitions. Um, they move into quadrantal angles. And with that, it's if it's terminal side, which we've labeled a couple of times, lies on an axis. So if they call it one of those types of angles, that's because its terminal side ended up on one of the axes. Another definition. As I kind of went through this when I was preparing my notes, I kind of pulled a lot of those bold words and definitions for us to just kind of throw here at the beginning and have those vocabularies. Okay. So with this one, we're looking at arc length. Arc length is defined as it is the length. of the curve along the arc. And so like if I were to go up here to say this angle here and connect connect this, I would say, okay, from here to here, the length of that arc. And we're gonna work more with arc length and we're gonna define a formula um, and really work with the ins and outs. But I wanna throw this definition up there um, as we get going. Okay, so kind of part two. Let's look at working with angles. Now working with angles, I'm gonna do part one. I'm gonna look at sketching. We're gonna be doing lots of drawing in this class. So make sure you're kind of got your pencil sharpened or a pen right there. Now I like to use different colors as I go and especially with drawing these angles and whatnot, I'm gonna try and do those as much as I can as well. Now, if we look at a complete circle, we know that a a whole circle is 360 degrees. So if we are looking at all these individual angles, we're looking at a piece of that. Um, so a couple of things that we need to work with is number one, let's look at sketching, say a 30 degree angle. Now in this course, we are gonna be working with radians and degrees. And here in a minute, we're gonna go from degrees to radians, radians to degrees. Um, and so whenever you're working with any problem, you need to make sure you first identify which one you're working with, okay? Um, so if I wanted to look at maybe a 30 degree angle, then that would look something like this here. There would be my 30 degree angle. 
Now I want to be approximate in what I do. I know no one's perfect and we're just kind of sketching these along, but to kind of accurately think about how would I even sketch that, I want to think about 30 degrees. And I want to think about it in relation to my entire circle, because if I were to start here at my initial side and go all the way around and end back up again, that would create my circle. You can see that that cuts that circle into four quadrants. And then within that quadrant, I'm trying to figure out how far to go up. I didn't want to go way up here. I didn't want to go out here, kind of put it about here. And the way I arrived at that is I thought about 30 degrees in relation to 360 degrees. If I reduce that down, that gives me 1 12th. So that means if I'm starting here on my initial side, I'm going to go 1 12th of this circle to create 30 degrees. Well, 1 12th doesn't really help me in the realm of this whole circle because, you know, it's morning. Y'all know how I am in the mornings now. Y'all get me at nine o'clock. I've already taught a whole lecture right before this. I'm gonna be a little bit more amped up this time because you don't have me at eight, you have me at nine. Um, so one twelve, think about this. One twelve, I've got this broken down into fourths. And so I want to know of this fourth, how would I create that? Well, one third times a fourth is equal to a twelfth, right? If you multiply these fractions, do you see how that equals 1 12? So that means of this quadrant or 1 fourth, I could split it into thirds and there's how I got my 30 degrees. You with me? Okay, now so let's do a different one. Let's look at negative 135. Okay, so I'm going to draw my quadrant here. Draw my coordinate plane there. Um, now I know it's negative, so it's going to have to drop down. I know that from here to here is 90, so it's going to be somewhere over here. And so let's think about this. Negative 135 degrees all over 360 degrees. Now when you write your degrees, make sure you put the degree sign on it. Make sure your notation is real good. You guys should be moving on into some calculus classes after this. I mean, as you move into your university. And so just make sure that your notation is really well because college algebra gave you a good basis and some people stop with that math. Um, but as you move forward, notation, notation, notation. If you were in my class, I'd start marking stuff off if you're in my calculus class and missing things. So make sure that as we move through trig here, you denote those degrees so we know what we're talking about. Now this reduces to negative three over eight. Just reducing our fraction, I'm not magically coming up with this. So again, I'm gonna have to think about this in relation to a fourth. So I'm gonna figure out what fraction will multiply by a fourth to give me an eight so I can figure out this. Well, I know four times two would give me that eight and one times three would give me that three. So I am going to need to move around from here one and a half to get me there. Okay, so here would be 135 degrees. And again, that's my negative degree. That's why I dropped down. Now, as you're working through kind of section one, um, you're going to see that you kind of had to create some. You had to think about how far rotationally we had to get there. And so I kind of want to work a positive one and kind of a negative one to get us going. Now, as you begin working with these degrees and whatnot, we need to have a conversation about converting. And a lot of times you are going to see probably more use of radians than you will see degrees. And so I want to have a conversation about how we can go from degrees to radians and radians to degrees. Now, if you're talking about degrees and radians, let's just start with a basis of something that we know. We've already worked with this on this page of having 360 degrees. Remember, 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi, right? So, that means if I divide them both by 2, 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. This is going to be the unit of conversion that we use the most. 
So let's think about this. I want to keep that there. So I'm just kind of work out here. side. I want to convert 270 degrees to radians. So what I like to do, I kind of have some chemistry days flashbacks. Um, I want to take 270 and turn it into radians. And what I like to do is set up basically a bunch of ratios to kind of get me there. And so I start with 270 degrees and I kind of make a railroad track. If you've ever kind of done conversions of units, um, the flashbacks that I have are back to chemistry. Um, so if you're ever trying to convert units, you almost kind of make a railroad track to kind of get you there. And so I am going to use this ratio here to convert my degrees into radians. So because my degree is on top here, I'm going to put 180 degrees on bottom here. So my degrees cancel and 180 degrees is equal to pi. So I put the pi on top. This is like two fractions, so I just multiply across and multiply across. That gives me 270 pi over 180. And then I'm able to reduce that um, and kind of get my answer. So you take 270, divide it by 180, reduce your fraction, and you get pi. Three pi over two. So this unit right here, it's going to be the most beneficial to you as we kind of work through this. Yes, the previous one works, but we use this reduced one. And again, I like to set it up as um, basically a series of ratios that are being multiplied together. And to figure out where I need to put things, I do it so that my unit kind of cancels as I go. So let's do another one. Let's look at. 3 pi over 2 and turn it back into degrees. So again, what you do is you want to start with your fraction. So I'm going to start with this 3 pi over 2. And I kind of make like a little railroad track along the way there. I'm going to use my unit of measure there. I'm going to use that 180 degrees equal to pi. Well, since pi is placed on top here, I'm going to have to put my pi on bottom in this next one so that those two units cancel. Pi is equal to 180 degrees. And now I kind of have my ratio set up. Multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom, and I end up with 270 degrees. You do three times 180 divided by two. My pi's cancel and I'm left with degrees here. And so being able to go from your degrees to radians and radians to degrees, this is going to be your best unit of measure to kind of work with that. Now what time, okay, I have us 9 to 5 to 10. But is that okay? Can y'all do 10? Or when does it get out? Dylan doesn't want to. Kristen wants to. <laughs> what time does your bell ring over there? It rings at 9.45. 9.45? Okay, so do I need to be done at 9.45? What do we need to do? We can go in the they told us we can go a little late to third period. So. Okay. Um, let's get as far as we can, and then we'll make a plan of action for next week. How about that? So today will be a little bit different. We're kind of getting our feet wet and figuring out what's going to work best for this, okay? Um, now, what time do y'all start? Like, what time are y'all sitting right there at that computer? Like, could we start earlier than 9.05? Again, the girls say yes. The boys don't want to. <laughs> Dylan just wants to be here, 9.05 to 9.45. What time does we this class period we start? We don't have anything before this. Like, we just have to get here when this class starts. So okay. Start early. Okay, well, I do have pre-cal right before this that I teach face-to-face, -face, and it ends at 8.55. So let's think about it, and then we'll get our plan going for next week. Kind of from here. So let's just plan on starting at 9.05 next Wednesday and yeah, let's just let's just go with it. Okay. Um, now, so that being said, part C, let's now talk about arc length. When we begin to talk about arc length, we pick up a new formula here. We have S equal to R times theta, where S is your arc length. 
R is your radius and theta is your angle. So this is super handy because if I have my radius and I have my angle, I can tell you how long that arc length is. Now arc length is also important because um, it leads into another formula, radian measure. And these kind of show themselves here in a little bit again. Radian measure is equal to your arc length divided by your radius. And so these two formulas together help you to get information that maybe you don't have. Um, if you didn't have what that angle was, you could take the arc length if you had it and divide it by your radius and get back to your angle. If you have your radius to your angle and you need to know like maybe how far you traveled to get from your initial to your terminal side, that would give you your arc length. And so both of these kind of together work to give you information that you may be missing from the given problem. Okay, um, we're gonna have to pick up a little bit of vocabulary here. I just felt like I couldn't throw it in at the beginning though without having to go through all of that. The next one we're gonna look at is called coterminal angles. This is two angles in standard position that have the same terminal side. Along with that, we need to pick up the word reference angle. The reference angle is the smallest acute angle formed by the terminal side of the angle and the horizontal axis. We're going to draw some pictures of these and it'll make a little bit more sense. Okay, so we know that a circle is 360 degrees. Okay, so we're good with that. We're good with drawing angles within that domain of 360. But you may encounter angles that are larger than 360. Say we had an angle that was 800 degrees. Well, everything we do is going to be based off this coordinate plane. So I've kind of got to figure this out here. So let's kind of walk through this and think about this. And we're going to kind of put all the words together. If I start here and I go completely around once, so that's 360 degrees, okay? But that, that just kind of makes it, you know, like 440. <laughs> so I'm gonna take that angle and I'm gonna loop around again. So minus another 360 degrees. And so I'm really getting close to being within my coordinate plane here. You'll notice that once I subtract off both those 306 degrees, I get to 80 degrees. And so if I'm drawing this, I went around once, I went around twice, and now I'm gonna get up to here, which would give me, put my little arrow here, 800 degrees. Now, I really don't wanna draw a bunch of squirrels as I go. So here's where this comes into play. Um, when we're working with 800 degrees, if we were to, we were needing something else about this, and as we move forward, we're gonna have to use more information with it, it would be more beneficial to us to just think about this as the smallest acute angle and just say, hey, let's just use 80 degrees as our reference angle. Reference angle is the smallest acute that's acute, it's less than 90 degrees. Look, it's a cute little angle, okay? And it's formed by the terminal side of the angle to the horizontal axis. So you can see this 800 degree angle went around once, twice, and then ended here in the first quadrant. 
So the best thing for us to do if we need to do more with this is to just use this reference angle of 80 degrees because it's the terminal side, they both end it there, and the horizontal axis. Now it doesn't always end up in quadrant one, it could end up over here in these other quadrants. But this one would be my reference angle for that 800 degree. Then let's go back to coterminal. It's two angles in standard position that have the same terminal side. You can see that the terminal side for 80 and 800 both gave you that. Okay. Um, so the next one is I would want you to kind of look at negative 45, but you got a lot of hubbub in the back, so that's a good stopping point for us. We will.